Good evening, everyone. Welcome to KAC and the Four by Twelves. Tonight, Ms. Whitney Barr, one of our esteemed junior researchers, will present her work on how hip hop culture is or is not, beginning with a dialogue about race in Korea. Whitney is using hip hop as a lens through which to understand the racial dynamics of Korea, a country that is experiencing a significant increase in diversity and polyculturalism. Whitney is using various data collection methods, including both qualitative interviews and quantitative surveys. She is also using social media to track trends and racial consciousness in Korea. Which means more specifically looking into the relationship between exposure to hip hop media and culture and Korean's racial attitudes. If a correlation can be found, which we hope to use her findings to shed light on the effect of racial stereotype and start a dialogue concerning black Korean racial relations. Whitney is a recent graduate of Stanley College, where she majored in English literature, especially related to race and gender. gender. <coughs> Whitney has worked with marginalized populations in the numerous diverse and unique settings around the world. While in Korea, she has also become involved in a Black History Month celebration. She has been conducting her work in affiliation with professors at the Hong University and Yonsei University. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome her. transcending and being localized. 
and that's what I believe is happening with hip hop in Korea. Uh, through this organic movement, organic movement, people are able to adapt new beliefs and ways to express and understand their identity. So to try to give you a, um, a little bit of understanding of what I found in my project, I want to share some stats with you. So first, um, this is, was a project done through an ethnographic approach. And I did various, um, I took various approaches because I wasn't sure what was going to give me the information I was looking for. So I had focus groups, interviews, surveys, um, going out to nightclubs, going to hip hop shows, and just observing behavior and the way that people interact with each other. So on my survey, I had this one question, if hip hop gives a voice to the voiceless, whose voices are not being heard in Korea? And first I should um, mention that um, my sample was, I, I could gather two groups, so some, one group was randomly selected people at these events. So people who were obviously interested in hip hop and were taking an interest in it and going to an event or some club. And then the other group were students, um, high school and college students from Daegu, Busan, and Seoul, where hip hop is um, growing the most. So one answer, <coughs> workers, I think it's who, those who don't have money, who don't love him or herself, people who, don't, who have a low level of education, the poor, the young, like students, homosexuals, Southeast Asians, those who don't speak Korean. Another one answered, yes it does because hip hop is so free, there's no rule, no regulation. Therefore, anybody can say something as is, is hip hop. Um, I think most of the people in Korea uh, does not have the political power or the voices, so we can hear our voice from hip hop. And lastly, Korean hip hop also affects to speak their mind. Uh, these were directly copied, so okay, those are mine. But socially, if somebody wants to speak strongly, then usually they will demonstrate or protest because the government, the Korean government, won't pay attention to Korean hip hop as a citizen's voice. Therefore, Korean hip hop is not as powerful as politics yet. Um, also, some, there were some other questions. So those were um, some of the answers for that. Another open-ended question I asked was, what do you think of the term foreigner? And one answered, overall, it sounds like a term used to exclude a group of people. Someone who is not Korean, so they don't understand Korea and Korean fully. And uh, another person said, it's a term that divides us and others. So we often use the word foreigner very casually here, um, but I believe that there's a definite, like, there's something that it continues to separate us, and by calling something foreign, then it means you have no responsibility to know about it. So I think that's very relevant to uh, in this case, black people, black, black culture. So Koreans, by calling us foreigners, are not responsible for knowing more or seeking a deeper understanding. Another question was, what do you think of the term gyokpo? Gyokpo is a Korean that is born living in another place. Uh, gyokpo is gyokpo. They look like Korean, but they're, they think like American, totally different. Uh, another responded, I think it's ironic sometimes because, in my opinion, the term gyopo implies that gyopos are different from the people we actually, we usually call foreigners. With the word po, which means brother or sister, also known as part of a family, the word gyopo implies that because they have Korean blood in them, they are part of the Korean family, or minjo, I would like to call it. However, some of my Korean American gyopo friends have confessed that, that a lot of times they don't quite feel they belong in Korea because the Korean people still treat them as foreigners. So in fact, they are not actually being treated as part of the joke. Sounds like, and another said, sounds like a food or something funny. And the last open-ended question was, what do you think of the term gamdungi? Gamdungi is equivalent to the N-word in Korean. Um, so one responded by saying, I think the word's cool without the I on the end, just gamdung. Uh, it sounds good, better than chink or japs or whatever. Well, I wouldn't use it unless the one takes it good because it's disrespect. That word gamdungi is too old to use right now in Korea, so a lot of my ages are 
not using it, instead calling black people hook young. Um, and hook young means older black brother. So I just wanted to share with you some of the thoughts that I've um, come in contact with through my research before I'm going forward. Um, also some stats. So like I told you, there were two groups, the hip hop group and then the students. So amongst the hip hop group, 52% stated that they've dated a non-Korean, while only 15% of students have. Um, amongst the hip hop group, 52% have friends of African descent, while only 18% of students do. 100% um, of the hip hop group said that they've talked to a foreigner, while only 91% of students have. Um, and I found that a bit shocking, because um, most students are taking English and um, even going to a hagwon. So you would, you would imagine at some point there would be some conversation that you might have with a foreigner, but 91% of them said, that the only 91% of them said they have. Um, and this one really struck me was, only 18% of those that I gathered from the hip hop group would introduce a foreign partner to their parents, while 2% of the students would. 63% uh, would introduce a foreign friend, while only 18% of students would. And 80% of all surveyed said they've seen black people on Korean TV. So sometimes people would come to me asking me about my project and say, well, I mean, I don't think Korean people have ever really seen a black person or, or, or like ever, but <coughs> I thought 80% was a pretty good number to at least see them on TV. So there definitely is some exposure. Uh, and 31% said they believe that, of all survey, believe that hip hop culture is synonymous to black culture. 25% of the hip hop group has used the N word before, while 12% of students have. And as far as the word gamdungi, 21% of the hip hop group and 27% of students. So I know there's a lot of numbers, but think they resonate, and I wanted to share those. Moving forward, um, beyond snapbacks and tattoos. So, hip hop's raw and unapologetic nature was birthed through an accidental scratch on a record player um, as a means of creating music where conventional instruments were unavailable to inner city black and Puerto Rican youth in New York um, during the 1970s. At that time, hip hop proved itself to be an agent that allowed a space for you to freely be socially, politically, and economically conscious and expressive about personal day-to-day -day narratives. Shortly after, in the 1980s, during South Korea's first um, period of massive industrialization, hip hop began to sneak into the hands of vendors in Akujang, where Koreans with a little more disposable income were able to afford um, a hip hop album or a hip hop magazine for as much as 20,000 won. And this was in the 80s, costing 20,000 won. Um, because of the strict censorship laws, all products concerning hip hop were only available in Korea through the black markets. So, so during that time, Koreans that were interested in hip hop were obviously really interested because they had to go out of their way to find it. Um, so some, I don't think a lot of people are aware of how long hip hop has been present in Korea. It seems that it's a new thing, but it's definitely been here since, since hip hop developed. So many of the Koreans that I have had the pleasure of interviewing have even confessed to me that the money that their grandparents would often give them during the holidays, they would secretly use that money to purchase Walkmans and CDs and listen to the music secretly, trying to hide this new developing culture from their traditional Korean families. Um, and instead of, instead of just listening to me, I want to share a clip from a former DJ, b-boy, rapper, and most importantly, a member of Korea's first generation of hip hop. And his name is One Son, and he is the owner of one of the only solely hip hop clubs in Hongdae. <웃음> 네, 안녕하세요 원선입니다 어, 제가 힙합을 가장 처음 접한 거는 어, 
그때요 글쎄요 제가 이제 벌써 한 25년 20, 25년 전쯤인데 아, 그때는 힙합 음반을 구할 수가 없었어요 한국에서 어, 그래서 그 미군 방송을 들으면서 거기 나오는 방송을 102.7 어, 그 방송을 이제 카세트 테이프로 녹음해서 듣곤 했는데 어, 기억나는 노래 두 개가 있어요 하나는 에어쿠즈의 락더 베어스하고 하나는 마닐라이스의 아이스 아이스 베드 네. 그런 것도 이제 녹음해서 듣곤 하다가 그러고 가서 한 2, 3년 아, 어쨌든 한 3, 4년 지나면서 이제 그 레스코스 티팝이 되게 붐을 했고요 그러면서 오렌지나 스노프덕이나 닥터주제나 이런 것들 듣고 잡았죠 그리고 그때 뭐 역시 미군 방송에서 네 그땐 지금은 AFN인데 그때는 AFKN이었어요 <웃음> American First Korean Network 그래서 그 AFKN 방송을 보면서 당시 TV에서 했던 소울 트레인도 기억이 나요 네, 그게 소울 트레인이었다는 것을 그때는 몰랐어요 네, 한참 지나고 한 10년 후에나 알게 됐고요 그때는 그게 소울 트레인인지 모르고 그냥 봤었는데 어, 되게 어, 들려오는 음악이라든가 구춤구춤 댄서들이라든가 어쨌든 뭐 당시에 제가 듣던 소리들하고는 어, 그리고 듣, 듣던 소리와 어쨌든 거기 추는 어떤 춤이나 이런 모션들이 굉장히 인상 깊어서 어, 되게 유심히 잘 봤던 것 같아요 열심히, 열심히 지켜봤던 것 같아요 그리고 뭐 계속 이제 힙합 음악을 듣는 이제 매니아가 됐었죠 매니아가 됐었고 팝이 제 인생을 바꾼 건, 뭐, 어떻게 바꿨냐, 라는 질문을 하셨는데, 바꿨다기 보다는, 어, 어떻게, 힙합이, 글쎄요, 저, 저희하고는 전혀 상관없는, 우리하고는 상관없는 어떤 그 문화인데도 불구하고 제 인생을 고정시켰다? 예, 네, 정착시켰다? sometimes uh, an overlearning of what Koreans may think is um, black culture because of their investment in hip-hop. So a lot of my research, uh, as I said, came from observing what Koreans are saying about hip-hop and black people in social media. So this is one image, and this is a clip from, some of you may know, this is from Coach Carter. And 
I would follow hashtags, and so that's how I found this guy. And I asked him because he said he's a hashtag hip hop. And I mean, this image is about basketball, but I asked him, so how is this hip hop? And he said, basketball equals Afro American equals hip hop. And I felt like it was very matter of fact. Like, <coughs> these things equal each other, and they're um, and it, it's limiting to what is blackness and what is hip hop, and it, it it makes it sound as if hip hop only belongs to black people and black people only belong to hip hop, which is really unfortunate. Um, but that's often what is interpreted here in Korea. So I want to step back for a second. As I said before, there's a need to see beyond these oversimplified racial binaries that constitute what it means to be a black man, a black woman, Korean woman, um, and a Korean man in no particular order. Korea's earliest definitions of black people came from missionaries that came over toting King James Version of the Bible and Oxford editions of dictionaries that use sexually aggressive and racially insensitive language to describe people of African descent and people of color. So therefore, those were the definitions that Koreans were given first. Uh, these racist theories strategically work to racialize black as the opposite of Asians, the model minority group. So um, what's interesting about that is now, how do you, how do you interpret what's going on with hip hop in Korea because of course, that means there's an intersection of Korean culture and black culture and hip hop culture together. So how are they functioning and renegotiating what it means um, and their own personal identities? So it was in Itaewon, a neighborhood that became permeated with American soldiers beginning in the 1950s, um, that South Korea for the first time came in contact with black people and forms of black music. And at that time, uh, mostly jazz, soul and then disco in the late 60s and 70s. And I want fast forward to the 1980s when South Korea started to become more industrialized. Hip hop transcended, as I said, um, from New York, from the Bronx specifically, to the streets of Itaewon, Shincheon, Apujong, and Hongdae. Those were the first outlets of hip hop in Korea. So many do not know, but Itaewon was a special place because it was a place full of night, nightclubs that utilized gaksoris, which were, uh, which are Korean beggars that often that earn a living by um, dancing and singing. So these gaksuris were responsible for um, dancing and singing outside of the nightclubs to entice the American GIs into the establishments. But the crazy part, the crazy part is, is that Koreans were not allowed into the hip hop clubs. Um, they were cautioned to stay away from the dangerous foreigner, especially the black man. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that the Gaksudis later became the first part of the b-boy movement in Korea. Um, soon after, uh, so they were, the Koreans were still not allowed to enter these clubs and were cautioned to stay away from the foreigners, they were cautioned to stay away from Itaewon, um, but soon after, Korean women, often underage, were permitted, began to be permitted into these uh, clubs. And actually, and they were, they were sent there to entice the um, male gaze, the gaze of men needs to be satisfied sexually having women in the clubs because most of them, most of the soldiers were of course men, so these women were allowed to enter. Um, and they're still present in some smaller numbers. Um, there's, uh, I'm pretty sure one of the larger populations is in Daegu and they're known colloquially as juicies now. But, so often, the Korean government was aware of these women going to these clubs, but uh, a lot of times it was just pushed under the rug because they saw it as a way of thanking the soldiers for their service in the Korean War. Um, but yet and still, the, these Korean women were then alienated from their families for, for taking this activity because it's considered not Korean, not Korean behavior. So that, that's going back to what I was talking about, Asian as being this biological essence of needing to adhere to certain behaviors. So while many Korean male youth were um, listening to hip hop and being a treat, it was the Korean women that had the first interactions with black people in Korea. 
and it was only through the cultural side of the nightclub. So hip hop's rich culture does not, um, it, it definitely exceeds the confinement of the nightclub and music. It includes the DJ, the MC, break dancer, and Korea B-boy, uh, the rapper, and the graffiti artist. Hip hop has always been enjoyed by people of various backgrounds, but its black origin cannot be denied. Thus, Koreans have historically associated Itaewon with American GIs, black culture, hip hop, and frankly, somewhere that a Korean should not be. Nonetheless, hip hop has and continues to charm Koreans to move their bodies and part their lips in ways that pushes Neo-Confucianism's ideologies of the sacred body and deliberate identity of Koreanness. Uh, Korean feminist Taeyeon Kim says, Neo-Confucianism's ideologies became known as the Korean mindset. Unlike the black bodies, the Korean bodies have been held sacred by these values. Hip hop doesn't confine limitations of the body, so Korean men can form a slightly new identity that asserts masculinity that has been um, denied them. Uh, they've been denied by um, larger society. Often the Asian man is thought of to be meek and um, intelligent, but not his presence isn't is never to be intimidating, and he is not to be thought of as cool. Uh, so engaging in hip hop just goes completely against that stereotype. Um, ironically, images of black women in 1970s American film fought to assert their control and masculinity through the Chinese practice of Kung Fu. Uh, so black men were historically considered animalistic and barbaric, but they used this um, martial arts form that's seen as, um, that's very respected, that's seen as militant, to try to assert this form of masculinity that they have been denied by uh, whiteness. And so I think it's the same thing is going on with hip hop in some ways in Korea. Um, you may disagree on whether the hip hop is authentic or not, but I think it's definitely offering a vessel where Koreans can, Korean men can feel like they're asserting what their definition of masculinity is. Um, I, can't, I can't say that hip hop doesn't push the notions of misogynism and patriarchy, but I think it still definitely is giving them um, an opportunity to assert a new identity that they weren't allowed before. And even when I've seen um, at different events and concerts, Korean men um, performing, I think it's, it's really special how they are assimilating just because they decided to take on hip hop. Um, you still see Korean men bowing on stage and politely introducing themselves in Korean um, and not losing what they value about their own culture for the sake of entering hip hop. So I asked this question, does being a part of hip hop make you as a Korean man feel more masculine? And this is what um, someone responded with at a, a focus group. So yeah, for sure, who can deny that hip hop is the most popular culture that contains machoism, titillating, provocative, simulating things? Nobody. Uh, and so when he said that, I said, wow. Um, it was something that I had already been thinking about, but I didn't, ex I guess I didn't expect, um, I guess I, honestly, I didn't expect a man to tell me that he was seeking out the, he was seeking out hip hop for that purpose, even though I feel like it's definitely happening, but um, that admission doesn't usually happen. So, <coughs> racialized bodies in Korea's hip hop scene, machoism through hook young. And as I said before, hook young is a term meaning older black brother. Um, and this is a fairly new term that's been created, but the archetype has always been there. But it's formed because of this desire amongst uh, Koreans, Korean men in particular, to attain an unrealistic and racially fabricated level of machoism through this image. The expectation that black men, all black men love hip hop, all black men have swag, are terminally heterosexual, and strong. And I like um, what, in one of my favorite books by Toni Morrison, Sula. Sula says that it's uh, every, everything in the world loves black men. 
But the black man is expected to behave in a particular way. Um, so is it really love or is it envy and desire? So there is, um, but as I witnessed firsthand, the body is not perfect, and nor is it static or silent. It seems hip hop has helped to provide the framework to expose the individuality and differentiation of the Korean male body. Both the black and Korean male body are undergoing a process of breaking away from standards that have been set upon them um, through the media and through religion and through popular ideologies. Uh, no, their, their narratives are not the same, uh, but both bodies have been emasculated by American and European media. So if hip hop is truly the global art of communication, then what are these two bodies saying to each other? Uh, due to the language barriers, there is a lack of direct communication between the two groups, but certainly hip hop has reached the Korean community and it's time to start thinking about how it's um, changing the way what we consider as black identity, Korean identity, and hip hop culture. Because, I mean, within America, before coming to Korea, I mean, I never thought about Koreans engaging in hip hop, just naturally never really came to mind. And um, even though Koreans are very, Koreans who are interested in hip hop are very much looking at what is going on in hip hop in America. So I think that we don't realize how much um, hip hop is being looked at through the lens of other people and what it's doing because it's not just a genre, it's, it's more than that, it's bigger than that. So often during interviews, male Koreans will tell me that they really respect the swag of black men. The swag is a term arguably of Scandinavian origin, and it means um, it's a heavy bag that sways, uh, a bulgy ba bulging bag that sways heavily or unsteadily. And hip hop has adopted this term to mean one who um, is, has this effortless sense of cool or fashion of calmness that people respect. So swag is often associated with the black male body. As interviewers share their reasons of enjoying hip hop, swag tends to come up again. Um, almost as this liberating feeling in contrast to the strict expectations of the Korean male body in everyday life in Korea and, and the world for that matter. Uh, one with swag is relaxed because he sets the tone and is allowed to freely express himself. This exemplifies how Korean, male Koreans study the black male body as a means of escaping their own. Whether this is consciously or subconsciously, uh, it's definitely happening. And, um, a few years ago when I was at Spillman, I did a project on how women, Korean women in K-pop, um, though women in K-pop are often written off as uh, too sexual or just pawns for, for men, I, I question whether they're actually using K-pop as a means to um, express their sexuality that they've never been able to get from the public Korean audience. So even though you may not enjoy K-pop, um, I think you still can't deny that at least it's giving them a, a means of expressing a new form of what the Korean woman is allowed to do. And um, yeah, so through music, people are, are renegotiating their definitions of their racialized bodies. Thus, as Koreans pay close attention to hip hop, again, how are they renegotiating their ideas of the Korean body and the black body? Because while they're thinking um, of how, they, a lot of times I've asked people, like, how did you get involved in hip hop? And they tell me, and I ask them, you know, like, what is it? And sometimes they'll, they'll just run off and keep talking and tell me, like, how they had to, like, feel like they have two sides of them. Um, the Korean who's on stage and the Korean who goes home to his Korean family. Um, those clothes being removed before stepping back into the home, taking off the shoes and coming back into um, traditional Korean culture and how they've learned what they feel like is supposed to be the image of Korean hip hop because of what they've seen and the images they've seen of black men in hip hop. and here in Seoul and other parts of Korea, but in the hip hop clubs. So, you know, they're watching, like, I've gone to hip hop clubs and 
suddenly when you come in, sometimes Koreans are looking at you like, okay, now now the real like now the real performer is coming. Now the real agent of hip hop has entered, and kind of there are these expectations that you are going to be the the expert or the dancer, which I'm definitely not. <laughs> and <laughs> so when you Google Hook Young Hip Hop, these are the images that come up. And just Hook Young, this is what comes up. Yeah. And I want to talk about this image. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have probably seen this emoticon on Cal. And I always felt a little uneasy about it. And so I looked it up, and I didn't know that they actually have profiles for them. <laughs> yeah, so this was this is his profile. And so he's supposed to be a bear, but I've never seen a bear with an afro. Um, and so, and his name is JG. <laughs> and so though, I, I wouldn't, I think, I wouldn't go as far as calling it racist, but I think it's definitely stereotypical. Um, there are other like emojis connected to him and he's supposed to be performing and dancing and so that plays into this um, idea that black men are supposed to perform, they're supposed to be entertainers. And so though it might seem playful, um, it's very limiting of the image. And then when I look at the other when I look at the other emojis, they look like characters. They don't look like people, but this one definitely looks to be a black man who's been turned into um, a character. So, uh, moving forward, I want to talk about uh, conflicting racial bodies. So, uh, there was an award show where Cy and MC Hammer, I'm sure many of you have seen it, they were performing together. And I'm wondering, like, was, was this successful? Like, are, are they able to share the stage together? Or as um, some Koreans have told me, one, when a black man and a Korean man are on stage together, one of them has to be the sidekick. One of them is never able, they're never able to be equal. And these were their words. And I asked him about it and he said, well, you know, I tried, as an underground rapper, he said, I tried to start performing with my other black friends, um, but, the audience couldn't take it. Like they can take a Korean who's interested in hip hop, and of course they can take the black man who's interested in hip hop. But when you put them together, there's something um, disconcerting about it. And I had never really thought about that. And so <coughs> uh, then I went back and looked at the the video clip, and I was wondering, like, are are we enjoying this because it's actually um, encouraging yellow face? Is it? Are we? kind of looking at the, are we looking at Psy from the American standpoint of, oh, look at this um, happy-go-lucky Asian man dancing on stage. And even in the Gangnam video, Gangnam style video, he is, I mean, he's in Korea, but from my eyes, I see him carrying out what he considers the American dream. He's, he has got women, they're living the lavish life, but he's still Korean, but he's not intimidating. And, He's not, he's not meant to be sexually attractive, but it's supposed to be entertaining. So I wonder if um, the same thing is happening in that video. And the juxtaposition of the Korean man and the black man is nothing new. Um, it is a popular Hollywood plot. I'm sure a lot of you have seen Rush Hour. And so there were a series of movies where they had a black man and Asian man put together. It's supposed to be the main characters. but. As you see in the film, one of them has to be the sidekick. And so um, Mita Manerji, um, a cultural critic, she says that this is the mainstreaming of racial identities and is for the profit of white America. So um, there's one scene in the movie where uh, Chris Rock is saying, like, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? And we laugh at that, but then when you dig deeper, it's actually going back to ideas that came about in colonialism and how um, these white explorers came to Asian communities and were 
during like it denouncing them because they didn't speak English. And this idea that when an Asian person comes to America that they don't speak English and so they are to be disregarded. So in the film, the black man is used to be entertaining and because of his face, he can be entertaining instead of um, seen as racist. But his body is just a vessel to um, portray thoughts of whiteness. And Jackie Chan is supposed to be thought of as the funny, happy-go-lucky Asian. Uh, so I know that's a lot, but I want to share that with you. Um, and there's one white rapper that I interviewed and I asked him, like, how does being white play into you being a rapper in Korea? Does it, does it play a position? And this was through emails. And we had been talking back and forth, and then he started to avoid the questions. And so I asked him, like, why, why is it that you don't want to talk about it? Because he said, oh, well, just ask me anything. And he said, well, I never had anyone ever ask me about being white. And I said, well, it, it wasn't an attack, but of course your identity as a white man is noticed in Korea and anywhere. But then he, he started talking to me and then he began to realize that because of his own identity, that he had embraced whiteness, which is where he could decide when and where he wanted to talk about race. And he didn't feel like talking about it, so he didn't want to, even though he's involved in hip hop. But it seems like, well, I mean, they take me as I am. I, I'm just, I'm, he told me, I'm just white. Like, there's nothing to be discussed about it. But race is, needs to be discussed. Uh, I'm running short on time. But I want to make sure I hit a couple more points. Um, so where does the black woman fit? There's an invisibility of the black female body in Korea. Uh, that's for various reasons. Um, most Korean hip hop videos don't have video vixens, and that would be the way that they are exposed to black women. And largely due to patriarchy, the female body is expected to be at home. So Korean B-girls have expressed to me what really goes on during practice when they are forced to work on their craft in the corners of the dance studios and consider finished when they get married and ch have children. But of course, the male body is still dancing. He's still able to do what he wants to do. And one, one B-girl shared with me that the dance community is quite diverse and open, accepting all races, but isn't sure how to approach or internalize foreign racial identities. She said, and I quote, outside of dance, Koreans are more closed-minded. You have to find your niche to get closer to Koreans, like dance or something. Um, and as a woman myself, I understand that I'm a part of this research. So even though um, when I first started in doing surveys especially, I would contact professors and teachers and ask them if they would let me um, conduct the survey on their students. And I tried to make it where the survey didn't sound like it was coming from a black person so that they would feel like they could answer the questions more openly. But um, then I went to one of my research advisors and she looked at me and she said, I'm not handing this to my students. And I was just like, what? And she said, um, it seems to me that you're ashamed of your own blackness and you, you need to do better. And I was flabbergasted because I was like, this, this Korean woman just tried, you know, she just told me that I'm allowing what I think that Koreans think about me to make me scared to get the answers that I'm really looking for in my research. And so that really made me um, think about how much I'm actually a part of the study and how much my identity, my intersectional identity as a black woman plays into the fact. And she said um, something that really stuck with me. She said, if, if they, are going to change their answers because they know your identity, then there's the issue in itself. So there is a really famous rapper. Oh, this is one of the images that comes up when you Google black women in Korea, in Korean. And I ask this question, Tasha T, she's arguably the most famous, the most talented rapper in Korea. And I argued, I asked them what, what is her um, identity. So 
So is, what is her racial identity? So is Tasha T, and the words are a bit small, so I'll read them out. Is she Korean, Gyoko, Black, Korean and Black, or other? And amongst the, the people, the hip hop agents, 50% said Korean, 29% Korean and Black, 14% Gyoko, and 5% other. Um, oh, 2% said just Black. Uh, amongst the students, 70% said Korean, just Korean. Um, 0% said black, 17% said Gyoko, and 4% said Korean and black. So even though they, there is a respect for her as an artist, her blackness seems to be dismissed, even though they celebrate her as a hip hop artist. But um, a lot of students, they said, well, she doesn't really look like it, so there's no need to talk about that part. The Korean blood is stronger, that's what they said. So, conversations of race um, have been happening forever in Korea, I mean, amongst black communities. And in Korea, there's a Facebook group, Brothers and Sisters of South Korea. And, and in this group, there are uh, roughly 5,000 members. And it's providing an outlet for black people and now other people of color to discuss their um, experiences living in Korea. Through my extensive research of hashtags on social media, and um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Koreans are expressing their understandings of black men and black women through social media, but because of cultural and language barriers, dire conversations between Koreans and black people living in Korea are not happening. Um, still, Korea is struggling to accept that they often have ignorant understandings of black people despite their romanticized relationships with hip hop. So as a, a Korean DJ told me explicitly in a focus group, and I quote, Korean people don't care about the history of black people in America. Just love what hip hop's from and what it says, rap and melody. Um, but it's in these everyday activities of drinking Korean soju and partaking in Norebang and social media that discussions of what Korean people deem as black is happening. Barely, but happening. And the fact is, is that South Korea is trying to position itself as a global giant and wants its culture to be more widely marketed through the government's How You or Korean Wave campaign. But they're, they're, they're missing this huge point that culture does not flow in one direction. And it's time for Koreans to acknowledge that their, their ideas of race and foreignness that stem all the way back to missionaries that came over are interfering with this expansion that they're desiring for, um, this attention that they're longing for from the world. Um, so they're struggling to hold on to strict standards of what it means to be Korean and Koreanness as <coughs> they're having to deal with foreignness. Uh, the first generation of hip hop in Korea seemed to have a more, uh, a bit more organic interaction with black people because they were interacting with the soldiers, the hip hop was, the hip hop um, culture was developing and they were growing with it from the beginning. Um, but nowadays, um, oftentimes Koreans are getting introduced to hip hop through friends and just seeking out bits and pieces through YouTube and other forms of social media. So there is, um, then there's this big gap, hip hop, black, and just kind of mesh together. So a lot of times, a lot is missed. And so um, Korean people that are already, this is another quote, Korean people that are already hip hop fans are already of the right mind. They already understand black culture more. The more you listen to music, you get used to the idea that there's more than just one image of different races and blackness. I, I think that's um, accurate. Um, people who listen to different genres of music are then seeking, okay, well, what does that person look like who made that song and developing a, a wider idea of what black people may look like. Um, but then um, a producer of SM told me, Korean people don't see music anymore. They're not interested in music because all we show about music is idols, right? But Asian people love it because it's Asian culture, right? Because Chinese, Filipinos, Vietnamese, they love it. So we try. We try. We don't. We don't want to go to America. We want to. We just want to sell the records and the out. I mean, sell the albums in Asia. But they don't. 
they don't try to make an artist. They're only trying to make money, I think. So in closing, uh, for so long, people of Af Asian and black descent have been isolated from each other by strategic plans of imperialism, and now their cultures are coming in contact more closely with each other. So racial consciousness and discussions of how race and gender are functioning in Afro-Asian encounters seem to be skipped over uh, by the general population. Uh, so it was a big challenge trying to get agents of hip hop in Korea to talk to me about this because when I would ask them certain questions, they would just tell me, you oh, know, it's just music, like I'm just doing what I love and kind of giving this romanticized um, view of what's going on. And I, I myself, I love hip hop, uh, but I also am aware of what's going on and there's more to it and how, and I'm trying to understand how race is functioning in Korea and hip hop. So there needs to be uh, more interaction between Koreans and blacks outside of the classroom, the military force, and partying. When a Korean uses racial slurs, it should be addressed. Use it as a teaching moment and not uh, a moment of attacking, but a moment of understanding where they got that from and then teaching them why it may have been inappropriate. So as black people in Korea, we should not fear sharing our culture outside of hip hop. Um, to Koreans, just as they proudly do of their own. This notion that openly celebrating one's culture to another, to another culture denounces the other needs to be ceased. So talking about your own culture, whatever race, whatever identity, whatever you know you cling to as your culture, it doesn't denounce another. Uh, so I think that the best way to do that is to start with the Korean education system and talking about race and diversity. Because if you're not if you're not talking about it within the Korean education system, then it will never be viewed as something important for um, Korean people to think about. So I had a clip I wanted to show. Do you have it? Uh, this will be the end. I, um, Jet and I, we, uh, Jet is a teacher in Daegu, and we conducted a, a small experiment of showing images of different races of people and asking the students, amongst the two pictures, which person is more likely to be a criminal, which person is more likely to be this, which person is more likely to be that, to try to start understanding what the Korean students think, because often they're not asked that question. So instead of using um, Jet, in the classroom to try to remove all bias, we use a, a Korean to ask them the question. <laughs> Thank you. 
아까 혜민이 남자가 했어요. 둘 중에 누가 더 좋은 사람 같이 보여요? 